Equity webinar series. My name is Jocelyn Nunez. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I work for OSPI Student Engagement and Support. I am the Administrative Program Specialist for our Student Engagement and Support team. And I am filling in for Kathy Anderson this morning. And today we're gonna be talking about setting up your school and classroom for belonging. This meeting will be recorded and is being recorded now and should be available in the next couple of days on YouTube. Closed captions are available in the menu if you wanna take advantage of that. And the PowerPoint and slides will be available to you in the chat and in our website. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll go ahead and just get started. This webinar is brought to you by the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction with student engagement and supports. And at OSPI, we believe that each student needs to be prepared for post-secondary pathways, careers, and civic engagement. The graduation equity webinar series was created with the purpose of highlighting best practices that increase access to education and ultimately graduation. Through our webinars, we are striving to think critically about historical contexts and the opportunities we have to get curious about and dismantle policies and practices that don't serve our youth. So we wanna make sure we make it possible for each student to have access to that instruction and support that will make them successful in school and in life. I wanna share with you this ancestral lands map I like this map because it's more informative about the lands we live on in Washington, and it provides additional context, right, for our communities to consider. I love the nuance of seeing that these lands are often shared by multiple groups of people and the way in which these borders overlap with one another. We ask that the participants of this meeting honor the traditional lands on which each of you are located today. And we'll go ahead and share re a resource sheet in the chat where you can get these links to this map. I would like to acknowledge the indigenous people who have stewarded this land since time immemorial and who still inhabit this area today. In my life, I mostly travel around the intersections of the traditional lands of the Cowlitz, Yakima and Cayuse tribes. Tribal consultation is a great way to get to know your local tribes and begin relationships and their families. And if you'd like to know more about it, we invite you to connect with our Office of Native Education. I think it's important we center our webinars in equity. We chose to open the year talking about setting up for belonging because we know that schools have the tremendous opportunity of addressing and fostering community and care for one another. And that the type of classes that do will always be intentional and they will be crafted to make students feel seen. They'll explore their identities and provide them a voice and choice in what they learn. Beyond that, we know that educator self-care is an integral piece and component of creating an atmosphere of belonging because they set the emotional tone of the room through their rituals, curriculum planning, and intentional ways that they get to know their students. 
We want each student to feel that kind of warmth. We hope that with this webinar, it helps you consider opportunities to increase belonging in your school and in your classrooms throughout the year, starting from day one. We hope that throughout this webinar, you take away your practice of being classroom, of practices, holding space for practices in building classroom, belonging from day one, learning from a, a teaching coach, educator about what's been working for them and their start for the year, and learning how social emotional learning and creating a sense of belonging are connected with one another. We also hope that we provide resources to get you all started. And we'll also learn from Sally and Vari about what advice she gives her teaching candidates for starting a new year. We'll to you to have Nick Yoder, and you'll get a chance to hear about the connection between social emotional learning and creating a sense of belonging. I'm joined today by my colleagues from OSPI, Tammy Bolin, our social emotional learning program supervisor, as well as Sam Mintz, our school climate transformation grants program supervisor. And we are honored to have Dr. Nick Yoder, the principal policy and technical assistance consultant for youth, family, and community development at the American Institute of Research. As I stated earlier, I'm also joined with Sally Anvari, who is the teaching artist and adjunct faculty at the Evergreen State College's Master's in Teaching Program. We also have with us our very talented American Sign Language team um, and interpreters, Lori Reinhardt, and Katherine Thomas. So we like to get to know our audience so, we'll, so that we can continue to tailor our content to your needs. We're gonna be launching a poll here and we want you to let us know what your role is, what grade band you're working with the most and how familiar you are with this topic. So I see them coming in, so I appreciate that. Looks like we have an array of administrators, counselors, community liaisons, teachers, even some paraeducators, some district office and OSPI team members, continuous improvement partners. We have a range of elementary, middle school. That's awesome. Thank you so much for, for, for all of you being here with us today, this morning. So how does OSPI support this work? We're going to move forward with what is, what is school climate? And I will let, um, before we go any further, I want to make sure that I've answered this question on what is school climate, but I think Sam Mintz is going to go ahead and let you all know what this is all about. So Sam, welcome. Hi, thank you, Jocelyn. I'm, I'm excited to be here today with all of you. So one of the ways that OSPI has been uh, supporting classroom setup from a systems level is with our work around school climate. But what exactly is that? Is it about the weather, perhaps? Uh, no. School climate is not about the weather, although this is a, a common misconception. 
Um, although also that animation illustrates the power that sunny, positive school climate can have on a school community that might be having a couple of rainy days. So if school climate isn't the weather, then what is it? There are multiple definitions, and these are the three that I chose to highlight. Um, the National School Climate Council defines it as the quality and the character of school life. The U.S. Department of Education adds that it's this broad concept that involves many aspects of the student's educational experience. And my personal favorite, the National Association of Elementary School Principals defines school climate as the feelings and attitudes that are elicited by a school's environment. So it's this, this big sort of broad concept, and at its core, it's describing how the school's environment is experienced by members of the school community. And school community including students, educators, caregivers, and staff. So how the school's environment is experienced, what are the quality of those experiences, <clears throat> and what are the factors that shape them? So then why does school climate matter? Well, positive school climate has shown benefits for students' uh, mental health, for school attendance, and for graduation rates. It's also predictive of improved health, of academic performance, and pro-social behaviors. It also has been shown to lower rates of student suspensions and of discipline issues in general. And these are just three examples of hundreds of studies that have shown the positive effects of improved school climate. And I hope you can see how this crosses over with, uh, with classroom setup because school climate is affected by and affects the setup of every single classroom. I'm now going to pass over to my colleague, Tammy Bolin, who's going to talk a little bit about how this intersects with social emotional learning. Hello, thanks, Sam. Appreciate it. I am Tammy Bolin. And I am the social emotional learning program supervisor here at OSPI and just super happy to be here. Um, I always like to begin with um, defining SEL because there's a, an abundance of information and misinformation out there around what SEL is. And it is the process through which individuals build awareness and skills in managing emotions, setting goals, establishing relationships, and making responsible decisions that support school, success in school and life. And how does that intersect with school climate and social emotional learning? So you'll see this Venn diagram. And on the left, you see the purview of school climate. And on the right, you'll see social emotional competence. And in the center is where they intersect. There are some gray areas in this, but um, key things are supporting relationships. So that is key in both school climate and um, in emotion, in SEL, <clears throat> excuse me. And, uh, and at that, the heart of this is those relationships and that engagement. So students must feel safe for both, for SEL. And there is a, um, a co-benefit for these. So if you have a positive school climate, you have the conditions that support SEL. And when you um, provide SEL, it improves the school climate. So it's kind of the chicken or the egg. But if you do both of those, and commonly, not commonly, previously, many times, uh, school climate and social emotional learning were um, separated. And so now there's been a move to really integrate those to de-silo and create teams, um, putting it into the MTSS tiered support structure 
Um, and uh, one of the other things you'll see in this center is cultural competence and cultural responsiveness. And we know that if students don't feel like they belong, then, then uh, it's not going to create a school climate and SEL will not be beneficial or may not be beneficial. So that, and um, in terms of SEL, my slides are not forwarding. <laughs> and I, there we go, okay, really delay. Um, so when we're talking about SEL, we're talking about the explicit, explicit instruction of SEL skills to all students. So that tier one level, universal support, um, ideally by classroom teachers, intentionally embedding SEL into their instructional content and adults modeling those SEL skills. So those are, and this is really key. And when you do that, you see there are hundreds of independent studies that consistently show benefits, the benefits of SEL in academics, which I think Nick will be talking a little bit, bit about, mental health, it creates those uh, protective factors around mental health. Um, it of course increases SEL skills. And then, and that's why I made it real big because it also improves school climate. Thank you. Uh, and then finally, um, social emotional learning online modules. I just wanted to highlight that uh, those are available for all to, and they're free uh, to sign up and um, go through. Um, they're geared toward educators, but I uh, wanted to call out a couple of the segments, which um, there's embedding cell SEL school wide, uh, creating a professional culture based on SEL, and that includes um, school climate as well. And then integrating SEL into culturally responsive classrooms, because we know that's imperative. Um, okay, and then Nick is going to be discussing Nick Yoder. I'm going to turn it over to you uh, to be discussing how SEL and starting off the school year impacts academic. Uh, Nick, you're up. Great, great. Thanks, Tammy. Hey, everybody. How are you all doing today? Um, I'm excited to speak with you all about social emotional learning and academic integration and really how to kick this off uh, at the beginning of the school year. Just to give you some context of who I am, um, I am a former first grade teacher. Uh, I'm a Midwestern guy, I taught in Chicago public schools, um, then went to uh, Michigan and did some instructional coaching, got my PhD, uh, and really thinking about the idea of social emotional learning and academic integration. When I was doing my dissertation, no one was talking about academic integration. So I've been thinking about this uh, for quite some time now. So super excited to share uh, with you all. Um, after my PhD, I kind of went, it started working at AIR, uh, doing a lot of state level work and district level work and supporting social emotional learning. I worked at Castle for a couple of years as their director of, of, of policy. I've worked at social emotional learning programs. Uh, so I've kind of done a, a wide range of things all related to SEL. So to me, super exciting. Uh, I'm going to try not to speak too fast. I, I always get pinged for that. Uh, so I'm going to try and maintain a good speed here. Uh, one of the things that I'm trying to be mindful of my own social and emotional skills. All right. So um, to get started, what I thought we would do actually is, um, and I'm, did I miss a slide? Nope. All right. So what I thought we would do is actually uh, do an emotion check-in right now. How are you all feeling? So when you think about the start of the school year, what do you normally feel? Excited, anxious, worried, inquisitive, energized, or other? Go ahead and vote. How do you feel? There's no wrong answer. You probably will feel more than one. Uh, I know I'm being very cruel in forcing you to pick one. Uh, but hey, uh, they're emotions and we can kind of navigate all of them. So go ahead, I can't see who's voting. So I'm gonna give you all a few minutes or a few moments, I should say.
Awesome. So uh, there's like a nice split in here, right? Ex between excitement, anxious, inquisitive, between excitement and anxious is our top two. Uh, I bet you most of you who are excited are also anxious and those of you who are anxious are also excited. Uh, but it's really interesting to see that there's a good percentage of, of you all who are really um, uh, kind of have those kind of polarizing, not necessarily polarizing, but two very real emotions in all of us. And I wanted to um, start with this because it, it may surprise you, but if we're going to actually begin thinking about SEL academic integration, I actually want to start with you all, the adults. How are we coming up and showing up with our kids? Because if we're thinking about how we're building relationships and belonging, we need to pay attention to our own emotional space as we engage in this work. So I've been doing um, so, some work around educator well-being in particular uh, as, a, as a former educator in the classroom, but a continued educator in life. Um, we kind of have to think about uh, what our own well-being. And when I've gone around and I've asked educators, I've asked individuals about, you know, what does it mean when you feel well or how are you feeling? People always uh, kind of think about and define it slightly differently. And as so as we're beginning uh, the beginning of the school year, it's important to pay attention to like how we're feeling and the things that kind of influence how we're feeling and what aspects of ourselves are we feeling that way or not. Right, so the one important thing to remember, so here is like some key pieces of information that we've learned about in terms of well-being. One, it's multidimensional, right? So you have your physical well-being, your mental, emotional, psychological, spiritual, cognitive, social, environmental, economic, right? There are a lot of parts of well-being that we have to pay attention to in us. And some will have more prominence than others, right? Because that will be influenced by our context, right? So how we feel is manifested differently depending upon where we're at, right? So it's also not generally a static thing, right? How we're feeling is very dependent upon where we're at. Also, uh, it's resource dependent, right? How many resources do we have, right? So it's not, lots of times people frame well-being as like a personal individual thing, but it's not. It is based on what is in our environment, not just in our context, but what are the resources that we have? Right? Do we have the necessary one personal resources, but do we have the social relationships do we need? Do we have the material resources that we need when we're thinking about education? Do we have the personnel resources that we need in order to be effective? Right? It's objective, meaning there's concrete things we know about it, but in often cases it's subjective, meaning um, it's a perceived feeling, right? So it's very hard to tell, make it, which makes it individualized, even though there is, it is dependent upon our collective and group, right? How the group is feeling. We know emotion contagion is a real thing. So how other people are interacting, feeling and understanding themselves will influence other people, right? There, there's even some recent literature that really shows that the leadership well-being then influences educators' well-being and how they perceive themselves, which influences students. Right? So we all have to pay attention, right? So this makes it important to think about each person and how they are feeling because it can ultimately influence the collective. So, uh, so, so to, draw, to, to draw down a bit deeper in this then, um, we've kind of created this, this framework uh, on educator well-being where it's really important to not only think about uh, these personal factors that we have, right? Tammy was just talking about our own so, like social emotional competencies, which we all have, right? That influence how we feel, our beliefs and motivations about teaching and learning, how much we have a growth mindset for ourselves, influences you know how we feel but we also have to think about these conditions and the how we in the ways in which we work and the in the in the ways in which we operate that influence our well-being so this is particularly important for leaders and then leadership teams and then us as educators in our in our own right to advocate for these various conditions that will help us right so in relational conditions might mean something like leadership how well does the leader set the tone for for the for the school how well is our um what is our discipline policy right and how are we really supporting our kids in the way that they are kind of disciplined and are we using more restorative um inclusionary practices rather than exclusionary practices right like that is going to influence how we feel about ourselves the way that we interact it's also about our environment right it's about the school climate that um 
Tammy and Sam were just talking about. How is the, the climate of the work that we're doing? And it's also about our career development. What is the professional learning that we're getting? Are we getting professional learning that's meaningful for us that allows us to cognitively engage in the work? Are we, do we have a career trajectory of saying, this is where I want to see myself in five years and do I have a plan for that? All of these things influence how we feel and understand. So as we're thinking about, again, tying it back to academic SEL integration, it's really important first to see how we are operating, how are we showing up in the environment to really support our kiddos in the work that they're, that they're doing. So it was like nicely theoretical. So what, is some, what are some actual strategies that we can begin doing, and particularly in your zone of proximal, uh, in your zone of, um, uh, uh, of control, right? Like what are you capable of kind of influencing in, in the work that you do? One is starting staff meetings with an SEL activity, right? Like this could be one of the three signature practices from Castle, like a warm welcome. It could be a peer sharing. It could be a quick collaborative task that you engage in, something that allows you to build relationships and form meaning with your colleagues. Uh, make sure to greet each colleague uh, you see in the hallway, right? Like one, we're a model for kids. And then two, you don't know kind of what your colleague has experienced. I was actually on a, a trip internationally uh, a few months ago and we said hello to uh, the barista and she was like, oh, thank you so much. No one said hi to me today. Right, and her face just like lit up. And so just really thinking about are we, we know it's important to say hi to our kids, but making sure we say hi to our colleagues and making sure that they feel seen, heard as well. Create a gratitude box. This could be in your classroom, it could be in your school. How are you showing gratitude with one another? Identify how to create a tap in, tap out system. So how can we uh, create strategies and resources to ensure that we are engaging in uh, processes to, to be able to go to the, to the washroom, to be able to take a two minute breathing break if we need it? How can we really work with our colleagues to ensure that we can, you know, be mindful of ourselves as well? Uh, determine a volunteer activity that staff can do together on the weekend or after school, right? Like what, like this is just a really great, you know, relationship building opportunity. Set personal goals. Like what are some goals that you can set and structure for yourself of what you want to achieve, but also what the community wants? Um, create a well-being committee at the school. Like what are some tools, resources that you can use, right? Lots of times we see people just kind of doing, um, you know, like snacks and coffee and stuff like that, which is great. But how can we really begin creating this climate in the school that really is supportive of educators as well? Um, advocate to your school district and state leadership in the work that you're doing. And then there's tons of other things um, that we I just didn't list and mention uh, that you all can actively engage it. But I'm going to ask you to actually share some out. So in the chat, how does your school support educator well-being? What does your school do? So I'm not asking about what you do personally necessarily, but what do you collectively as a school do to promote your own well-being? Ooh, staff spin class in the gym once a week. That sounds fun. Friday potluck, breakfast before school, food, more food, recognition, Tuesday treats, the staff lounge, social opportunities, celebration Fridays, staff field trips, weight loss competitions, staff get togethers, gorilla tailgates. I'm really curious what that is. Uh, social activities, special treats, um, a nine week activity wellness wheel, chips and salsa after work, communities check in, a comfort corner, nice chairs to relax on staff, dress up days, treats, food and get togethers. Staff hikes, barbecue, graze days, go to each other's classroom for something different. Wow, crock pots, right? So there's lots of things that we as educators do to, to ensure that we're building community and engagement. And one of the things that I think we um, need to challenge the, the system for is really thinking about how do these other pieces like career development, like uh, professional learning days, like, um, uh, uh, all these other uh, school climate, leadership, all these other things that uh, that influence our well-being, how can we really kind of lean in and engage on those along with these really great um, relationship oriented and gratitude oriented things that you all are doing at a school. So I always find that to be a challenge in working both with, with states and district leaders as well as just kind of thinking school leaders too, to think a little bit more holistically, but those are awesome 
uh, things that you all are doing. So thank you so much for sharing. And the last thing um, I think that's really important to consider, and this is just gonna be a, a tool that I'm gonna uh, drop in here for you all to kind of think about, is really thinking about um, your own competencies uh, and work that you do, meaning that um, it's a, this is a self-assessment reflection tool on your own competencies. So similar to, to students, when we have you know the castle wheel, self-awareness, self-management, social, um, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making, we as educators similarly have uh, those uh, skills and assets and competencies as well. And then we bring them with us into the into our classroom, right? Like, so we build relationships with certain students. We have emotional uh, responses uh, in response to classroom interactions. We manage ourselves differently. We make tons of decisions on a daily basis. So it's incredibly important to kind of think about and reflect on those. Um, so this self-assessment tool kind of really helps you kind of gauge and understand how do your competencies influence your interactions with your students um, and with your interactions with colleagues. And with that, this is gonna to go to my second poll, is when you're thinking then about, you know, these big competencies, and I, I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with SEL uh, and the core competencies to some degree, what competency influences your work with students the most? So if you had to think about your work with students, which competency do you think influences your work with them the most? And I will pause for a moment for you to respond. Great, thanks. Relationship skills. So it is overwhelming uh, that you all think relation, your relationship skills are the most important um, and, and influences your work with your students the most. So uh, I'm not surprised we know relationships are critically important. Um, and I think Ben, that is incredibly important to see. So appreciate you all uh, being vulnerable and responding to the, the poll in that. Um, the other thing that I think is really important in this, that tool that I'm going to share, uh, or actually as we be kind of begin thinking then about academic integration, what does that mean and how are we thinking about the school year, um, and it's actually also a part of that tool, are these 10 educator practices that promote social, emotional, and academic development. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on these because uh, I don't think I have too much time left. Um, I probably should have been timing myself. Uh, but uh, in a lot of the work that I, I've been doing with educators is thinking about what does intentional social, emotional, academic development mean? Because um, when we look at surveys, we look at national polls, um, educators overwhelmingly uh, believe in the importance of social, emotional development as do uh, principals and families and students. Uh, but when you ask, uh, how do you integrate social, emotional learning, people, a lot, a lot of educators still claim that it's still unclear of exactly what it means and looks like. And so what we're gonna kind of do in the, like this last uh, little bit of time with me is actually think about uh, what does that mean and actually look like? So I'm gonna provide sort of two strategies to begin thinking about it. And the first are these 10 educator practices and all these practices in here, um, oh, I have time, thanks Jocelyn. Um, <laughs> all of these practices in here are uh, focused on, uh, and you look at them, are things like, oh, I do this in my classroom, or, or yeah, I see this. Um, and so, but the idea is like, how are you being intentionally focused and supportive using these practices in supporting kids' social emotional development? Because oftentimes we might, um, you know, help kids solve problems in the classroom, but we aren't necessarily always using the intentional language of, hey, what is the problem or goal of this problem that we're trying to solve? Can we stop and think about what is your point of view in this problem, right? Like all of these things are, are skills that we can help students develop in engaging in these practices, right? Like how do we help kids uh, create, uh, be responsible and, and, and have choice, right? What does it mean when we're offering choice to kids? Does it mean we're having a free for all or is it, are we using choice boards in a very strategic and timely way? When we're providing warmth and support, does that mean we have to be fuzzy and lovey? Or does it mean we know how to be there for a kid and show up for them and say that we know that they, they care because we follow up with them and we 
ask them questions and we know about their life, right? And so it's really important to think about then how are we framing these in the context of helping kids understand the social and emotional skills that they're using and that we as adults are using too, right? Group discussions, how are we really helping kids perspective take and listen and begin to take ownership of, uh, of classroom discussions? I've been in hundreds of classrooms doing observations and I feel like classroom ops, class and group discussions are one of the hardest things to actually facilitate where it doesn't always bounce back to the teacher before bouncing back to the students. So it's really thinking then about uh, even how are we helping frame and scaffold these experiences so kids know uh, what are the communication skills to be able to respond to one another and uh, respond in a way that they're listening to someone else and not just uh, based on what they're thinking, right? Because even us as adults have problems with that. Balanced instruction. How are we, when we're just going and engaging in direct instruction, how are we regulating ourselves to pay attention to uh, the work that we're doing? How are we really understanding uh, how folks are thinking and feeling um, in when they're listening and processing that emotion? But when we're engaging in query-based instruction, how are kids able to find resources? How are they able to ask for help? How are they able to provide help to other folks, right? All of these things, um, we sometimes assume that kids know or know in a consistent way, but we all have different ways in which we operate and interact and that can learn from one another based on our own lived experiences. So it's really important to think about how are we um, really trying to support and understand each other, right? So all of these skills um, are incredibly important to think through and understand or, or practices to think through and understand how are we really supporting kids' social, emotional, and academic development. And yes, and if you have questions on any of these things, please don't hesitate to you know, drop a, a question in the chat or in the Q&A box too. Um, so the last thing I, I'm gonna kind of talk about um, more fully is this idea of um, as starting the school year with SEL academic creation, right? Well, the first thing is we want to think about the practices that we are going to use and embed and how are we going to be intentional with that, right? Like that's why I kind of talked about those practices. But now the next phase is, well, what, well, how do all academics and, and um, social emotional skills align? How are they connected with one another? Because oftentimes when we see uh, a variety of um, alignment documents, alignment tools or whatnot, People just kind of list things of how uh, social emotional skills operate. And when I was uh, developing that last brief, we were kind of writing explicit examples about um, social emotional competencies and academic instruction. But it was, we didn't necessarily have a framework of what those examples meant. We kept going back and forth of being, of, of asking each other, um, why does this align, right? When I've helped, um, you know, educators kind of align their state SEL standards or competencies and their academic standards or competencies, they uh, always ask, well, why, do, wh what is it about this that actually aligns? I don't really see it. And so this taxonomy is meant to showcase kind of the different ways that social emotional skills show up. And it's important to think about at the beginning of the school year. So we can, again, that intentionality of how can we be intentional as we plan for our competency or plan for our instruction uh, how can we be mindful of the social emotional skills that students need to engage in those various activities, right? Because if we're just scaffolding the classroom discussions, if we're scaffolding responsibility and choice, we need a way to think about those skills and how can we naturally embed them in the ways in which uh, academic instruction occurs. So if I'm thinking about, so what is this taxonomy then? So we created this alignment. I'm going to go a little bit more in detail on each of them. There's kind of four different ways we see that they show up. There's like an explicit skill alignment, explicit strategy alignment, ways of interacting and ways of being. So uh, the first one is explicit skill alignment. It's the easiest one. Uh, it's where there's a direct link between the academic standard and the social emotional skill. Meaning uh, that the specific social emotional skill and the academic standard are the same. They're the same, they're the same one. So what does that mean, right? If in science and in SEL, both ask us to evaluate our biases and how biases influence decisions and evaluate facts, right? Like that is a science skill that we need to learn. And it's also a social emotional skill that we need to learn, evaluating our biases and how they influence our decisions and how they, we evaluate facts, right? So when we're engaging in a science lab or we're engaging in a social emotional skill around biases, 
we can kind of, we're kind of teaching the same skill, albeit they might be applied slightly differently in different contexts. Similarly, both social studies and SEL both have understanding how behaviors influence the social environment and others, right? You look in the academic social studies standard and you look at a social emotional curriculum um, or even the, the Washington State SEL standards, um, it's, they're both there, right? It's the same thing. So when you're teaching in a, in a curric, SEL curriculum or in a social studies curriculum, we're teaching the same skill. But it's always not just the skill, it's also the strategies that we have to engage in, right? So in explicit strategy alignment, it's a direct link exists between the practices required to engage in the content and the social emotional skills to engage in that pra content practice. Meaning, um, you know, there's specific subjects like math and science in particular that has these series of practices related to them. And it's uh, in those practices, in order to engage in those practices, you need a set of social and emotional skills, right? So math practices require students to construct and share arguments. In order to construct and share an argument, so in order to be successful with that math practice, you need social emotional skills, perspective taking and communication among others, right? But those are some core ones that you have to take. Similarly, an ELA characterization is a key practice that kids and skill that kids need to engage in. In order to successfully engage in characterization, you need empathy, right? And you need to be able to understand how emotions and situations connect with one another, right? Both of those are social and emotional skills that are required to engage in that math content or math, or sorry, that ELA content or practice um, in characterization. The third one is ways of interacting. So how are the social and emotional skills like mediate success? So this is really saying, um, how can we as a, uh, how do we as a group want to interact with one another or within ourselves in order to be successful for this practice? So meaning that students use social and emotional skills to interact with each other to be successful. Um, so it's sort of similar to explicit strategy alignment, but it's more of a, of a broader approach of how we engage. Right, so in physical education, for example, um, students um, are gonna engage in um, lots of different types of activities, right? Uh, in sports-based activities. But in order for kids to be successful in that, they need to have conflict resolution skills. So you might do a conflict resolution lesson or something like that prior to you know, your activity. So that way kids know how to interact with one another, um, particularly if something, you know, they, they engage in something where they, they have a conflict or a problem that, that occurs. Um, or if you're in, we know from a lot of math literature, kids get anxiety during math tests or exams and whatnot. So if you just take a pause and have kids do a mindful minute or a breathing activity or some sort of stress, their own stress reducing activity, uh, prior to that, they're going to engage in it and um, they're going to engage better in that math. So, right. So it's a, it's a self-centering activity that supports the way that they interact with themselves or with others to into that content. And then the last one is um, uh, ways of being is, uh, um, is showcasing that as, uh, as humans in the different domains that we are, right? This showcases that social emotional skills are different in different domains of our lives and we use them differently. And the same thing is in content domains. Um, people will use social emotional skills in different ways, meaning like uh, geographers, mathematicians, authors, scientists, we all, everyone has a set of social emotional skills that they use, but the ways in which they show up will be different. Um, so it's important for kids to see that, right? So, um, because kids, you know, may in a math class are really good at setting goals, but maybe they are not quite sure how an author would set a goal and kind of revise their work, right? And so it's really thinking then about how our mathematicians, authors, right? Like, plan, set, uh, and act their goals that are subject specific. Similarly, like we think about like scientists and explorers, they each have to anticipate the consequences of their actions, uh, but they're gonna do so in slightly different ways, right? Because they have different variables, different goals, different processes to interact with. So it's helping kids um, name them. Again, it's developing that intentionality of naming these, these skills so that when you go into other domains of their life, they recognize that they already have those assets as they work and move in there. So um, just the, some implications for the beginning of the school year, uh, right? It, this really helps us think about how do we want to scaffold and build the social emotional skills that students need to be successful throughout the year? And how can we be planful of when and how we do that? Meaning when are we going to explicitly teach these skills? 
When are we going to embed them in the practices? When are we going to reinforce them? When are we going to reteach them? Right. So it helps us kind of set up this taxonomy of, of, of thinking about uh, and ways of being intentional about uh, using our social emotional skills in the academic space rather than um, seeing them as something separate or added on or nice to have, but really kind of being intentional about how folks navigate uh, their work. So uh, that's what you have from me today. I hope you found it uh, somewhat useful and engaging. Uh, I think I was pretty slow. So if you thought I talked fast, this is actually slow for me. So I hope I was fairly successful in that. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, pop them in, ask them. If not, uh, no worries, I'll be around. Thanks so much all. Thanks so much, Nick. We appreciate that. I think this is a really good uh, pausing moment for us to go through Q&A. If anyone has any questions for Nick or even for Tammy or Sam, please enter them in the Q&A and we can stop for a minute just to get folks. And if not, we can continue going. Let's see what's on the chat. So we've got Jessica Decker who made a point to say that in the district behavioral program, we use the SEL curriculum Why Try, and it encompasses a lot of what Nick was speaking to earlier. Um, teaching students, Jessica also mentioned that teaching students how to ask for help appropriately instead of escaping when a task is too difficult. Yes, we agree. All right, well, we'll go ahead and keep going. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks so much, Nick, for, for your input today. We really appreciated that. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your time. There is a question in chat now. Uh, do you have any set curriculum that is of high quality that is research-based? Um, yeah, I mean, there's lots of high quality SEL curriculum that, that exists. Um, so uh, I, I know that uh, I want to be mindful of not to like uh, say too many. Um, I know Harmony Social Emotional Learning is a good uh, curriculum um, that's free to use. Second Step is a great curriculum. Um, um, responsive Classrooms is great. I mean, there's tons of them. So I would go to the, actually the Castle Guide of Evidence-Based Social Emotional Curriculum. And there's ways to actually... Um, pick your needs of what you want, and then they are all uh, evidence-based and they have levels of evidence in there. So that's how I would uh, find a curriculum for sure. But more than happy to talk offline too, if you'd like. I'll pop Thank my you. email there. Thanks, Deborah. Okay, there's one more on the Q&A that says, may have missed this when you were giving us so much wonderful information is there research outlining a direct link between purposeful SEL planning and student outcomes? Great question. That is a great question. Um, and let me go to it so we can actually see it too. So, uh, purposeful. so when we're thinking of, so the evidence on SEL, I would say is almost all purposeful. And what we, there was a recent meta-analysis too from um, Chris Cipriano um, at Yale and a number of colleagues among the other um, meta-analyses, I think there's been about 10 or 11 done at this point, and almost all of them talk about the importance of fidelity of implementation. And so the, I think the whole process of really thinking about um, the purposefulness in that is really thinking then about how are you understanding and are using a program in a way that it was intended usually produces better effects than when you kind of like pick and choose various things than not. So I think that purposefulness um, in the research is really based on then like, how are we really implementing programs with fidelity? And that's both explicit instruction pieces as well as other programs that are more based on like those general practices that I that I talked about previously. So there's there, it's variations too in those programs. Thanks so much. So we're gonna go ahead and move on and we'll get a chance to speak to Sally but we wanna pose the question, well, what does this look like in real life? What are the foundations of practices? And we'd be remiss if we didn't introduce Sally. So Sally Anvari is currently moving through life as a midlife white European, middle-class, 
medium sized non disabled cisgender female who is the granddaughter of Eastern Washington farmers and grocers, daughter of musicians, educators, and business owners, sister, sister in law, aunt, cousin, friend, partner and a bonus mom, godmother, and learner with certain needs while tending to autoimmune disease, grief, trauma, and well-being. Sally lives in Olympia, Washington with her team and Bari and enjoys many things, including random acts of dance, bike rides under trees, and coffee with her cream. Sally's moves of the past received her bachelor's in anthropology, sociology from St. Olaf College and served as an AmeriCorps reading tutor and leader, worked as a paraeducator and received a master in teaching degree from the Evergreen State College where educated students at middle level for almost a decade earned a national board teaching certificate and became a mom with a blended family and worked as a contact tracer with Thurston County Public Health. Trained with Arts Washington Teaching Artist Training Lab, also known as TAT Lab, supervised teacher candidates in the Master in Teaching Program at Evergreen State College, and taught creative dance and hip hop at Johansson Olympia Dance Center and completed the Creative Dance Center Summer Dance Institute for Teachers. As Sally works, creates, and moves forward in time as an educator and teaching artist with various ages in diverse public and private spaces, she continues to ask these questions. How do I place my gifts at the service of community, equity, and social change? How do I create educational experiences that are healing and transformative? And how do I guide learners to inhabit themselves with confidence, confidence and compassion becoming ablaze with genius, joy, and love. So welcome, Sally. We are so happy to have you. We're going to stop to just have a conversation. So Sally, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi there. Thank you so much. Um, listening to that intro, um, I just... Yeah, it kind of made me a little bit tired. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for the patience for all that, for all those um, moves of the past. And um, I just want to say thank you to Nick. I really am grateful for the work that you are doing to look at educator well being. That is a really important topic. Um, I also want to say I'm honored to be here. And I am very grateful for the ASL interpreters and my apologies for my learning edge about um, how to say proper names and things that make your work a little harder. So I'm gonna learn as well here. Before I go any further, I feel it's important to describe what you're seeing on the screen. Um, and then I also wanna just take a quick body break because that's something that I try to incorporate in my um, teaching and learning as well. So um, just want to describe if you're not watching this, this webinar, um, what you see is me and I have reddish brownish blondish curly hair and I have glasses with slight, slight um, cat eye. And um, as was mentioned, I'm a white woman, mid, midlife. I have a black t-shirt with a beautiful print um, of a uh, black young girl with Afro and shady B in white print lettering. The background you'll see behind me, you'll see maybe a cat, you'll see some books and some posters and um, a chest of drawers full of some uh, materials. 
I hope that gives you a little bit of sense of what you're seeing. And I'd love to take just three minutes to care for myself and also for you to do whatever you need to do. Um, write down something you want to remember from Nick sharing. Drink water, look away from the screen, close your eyes, stand up, lay flat on the floor, whatever fits your needs. And I'm going to be doing the same. And while doing this, I have just a little mental task. So we're going to be taking care of our bodies, but then I have a mental task. If you could consider the name or names of special beings in your life who helped create an experience of belonging. So three minutes, we're gonna take care of our bodies. And if you could also think about names of special beings in your life that helped create an experience of belonging. So I'm gonna turn my screen off. You'll know it's time to resume, come back. You're gonna hear me saying names of people that helped make that happen. So I will see you back here in three minutes. Thank you. Mary, Donna, Tupelo. And if you could, if you fill up for it, write down or say the names you consider during break to yourself. Just say them. <clears throat> if you want to put them in the chat, I am totally fine with that. Um, they are special people in your life. And gratitude to all of them. They are here with us as we talk about belonging. When I was asked to have this honorable place on the panel, I was thinking, oh, you know, I, I need to think about this. It's such a big concept. So I wanted to share some quotes from Brené Brown that um, grounded me a little bit in the work. Brené Brown, social, research, social researcher said in Atlas of the Heart, Love and belonging are irreducible needs for all people. In the absence of these experiences, there is always suffering. And because we can feel belonging only if we have the courage to share our most authentic selves with people, our sense of belonging can never be greater than our level of self-acceptance. And again, that's from Brené Brown, social researcher, Atlas of the Heart, Mapping Meaningful Connection. Oh my goodness, Sally, that is such a great quote. Yeah. I was thinking about that because we had, we've actually as a team at with student, our K-12 team and student engagement and support, we actually read Atlas of the Heart and we started our week with just talking and having some discussion around where we were at in the book and just the different stages in which we've moved on um, throughout our life. And I think you do a really good job also, like I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about like your permeability in your classroom and setting, um, how has that been like? And how do you set that kind of classroom up? Thank you. Yeah, I um, You know, I, I've had this passion about permeable classroom. It's inspired from um, research I did at the Masters in Teaching. And that term I want to give credit to Anne Haas Tyson. That was the person that first introduced it the idea to me. And when I think about permeable, I think about how my life and who I am as a person can exist in the classroom and how the lives of the students that are coming into the classroom can flow in and out, be part of the lesson, part of the experience in our classroom. So I, um, for example, I have always been a mover and dancer. So you will see me in my classroom paying attention to the body 
in pain it and and I will do that with my teacher candidates in the masters in teaching program. I will be asking them how are, how's your body feeling. Are you taking note of have they moved today, are you having the students move around for an activity um, so that's my personal like. Um, view uh, and something that's in my life and it will permeate the things that I do and and then I also am considering the life um, the lives of the students that come in and out the different literacies that they experience um, how they can exist with us while we're learning and <clears throat> Yeah, so, and I consider how to, you know, center the thriving of all human bodies in my care. You know, uh, Resma Menachem um, said, your body, all of our bodies are where changing the status quo must begin. So that's something I really hold dear and think about how to do that. And um, one of the ways that I do that is doing some um, different activities, movements that bring the body into the practice. So that's one realm. And then another way that um, I think about, I think about the sensory experience of students. So that permeability, you know, and I was asked like, what's your process for getting set up for the year and then carrying that through. And I was thinking, you know, sensory experience the, of the learning space um, is really important. Senses help create meaning and memor memorable experiences. So I asked, you know, I'm just asking the questions, what do they see that connects to them, their life? and engages curiosity and um, emotions? Do they see an agenda with clear time markers and a bio break in there? I know for folks that are dealing with um, a need for a little bit more control and autonomy, need to be able to track time and have a sense of when they can have that independence and power. Um, names, are the names, are there names in the room? How are they in the room? Um, one thing that I do is I handwrite their names on something that is given to them. So when a student enters the classroom, there will be a gift of something, whether it's the comp book they need for the year or um, just even a name plate, a name tag, something that calls them into the room um, and they see that I've handwritten it. That's my, that's my process, that's my style. Um, what else do they see? Um, they might find pieces of a puzzle that they have to find the next group mates to put the puzzle together. Um, they might see when they walk in for those first few days or weeks, desks in circles, squares, chairs, no chairs. Depends on um, my intention. Is my intention to play common ground where we are seeing how our differences and our similarities are in the room. They might see me mingling and moving around. I try not to be the sage on the stage as much as I can um, uh, in, in the first few days and throughout the year. And these are questions that, I, you know, with the teacher candidates that I work at, what do they hear? Are they hearing music? Are you hearing music? Are you hearing some of your favorite music? <laughs> <laughs> to keep you alive and joyful in, in that space. Um, do, you know, so one example of a see and hear thing that I, um, that I used to do in a sixth grade humanities classroom, post the words to a kid prez quote. So I, I have taught secondary level, middle level mainly, kid prez quote by the door, because I wanted those words to greet students as they entered and then had a closing ritual. This was every day, if, if I was in the room, that used that sign and the kid prez words. I stood by the sign and the words, I said the words to signal the end of the teaching and learning for that day and to begin the transition. And their exit could either involve telling me something from the day of learning, telling, or just a simple fist bump, but some recognition. So I recognize them when they come in and I recognize them when they leave. Um, and I think that those opening and closing moment, those rituals, and so many, so many teachers do these great things. I'm saying things that I've been, I've learned from other great teachers. I am echoing so many good, so much good work out there. Um, so uh, I, this is not like uh, my idea. These are ideas that have been inspired so by so many great educators. And um, yeah. 
Thank you, Sally. I feel like you're painting a really good picture of what your classroom space looks like. And so uh, what I'm wondering is what do your first few weeks of school, like what kind of lesson plans are you implementing or curriculum that kind of helps paint that picture that you're speaking to, um, to make sure a student feels like they're welcome in, in their space and making them feel like this, they're just part of this space and they're not in addition, but rather part of something. I'm wondering what does your lesson plans look like as an educator when you're getting started with the year? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I taught mainly uh, English language arts, humanities, reading. Um, so I, some things that I tried to do was work on that inference skill, the observation skill, the um, making those assumptions and what leads you to those assumptions. So a lot of the beginning lesson plans would be also um, like doing some shared readings, some discussion um, of poetry um, or videos or podcasts or stories that relate to the whole beginning of something and the emotions and feelings that come up when you're in a beginning moment and what it's like to be in transition. Um, for example, I would do this shared reading and discussion of the descriptive, a very descriptive kind of sensory experience cafeteria moment from Autobiography of a Face by Lucy Greeley. And we would sit, you know, we'd read it and have the students guessing, inferring, what's it like to walk into the cafeteria as this character? And then we would connect that to their experience in school in cafeterias. Um, so, yeah, that so much of what I would read or discuss or bring in would be trying to connect to that emotional world that they're experiencing at the beginning of school, name those emotions through characterization, as um, Nick was talking about, that, um, that implementation of, of SEL. And then also through the structure of time and um, collaborative group work thinking, uh, the Kagan co cooperative learning structures. I was great, lucky to get that training early on in my um, teaching career. And that really helped me think about how to structure classrooms so for cooperative learning. You spoke earlier with us a little bit about creative dancing. And I'm wondering if you can tell us how is it that you implement some of that routine and how do you honor that in your classrooms? If you can share with us a little bit about that. I am so glad you asked. Oh, yeah. And this is this is the part of me like demoing a little bit of the authenticity of self, being vulnerable and because um, dance, movement, body, talking about the body is still feels a little bit risky in um, school spaces. And so this, my master's in teaching candidates, they got used to a starting field seminar with the brain dance, um, which is um, gratitude to Anne Green Gilbert up at the Creative Dance Center. And I have found the brain dance to rest the mind and the body. And we know that, you know, I've learned, thank you Evergreen State College faculty and staff, and I've grown to know that when the resourceful human body with this brain feels safe, happy, and connected. We all know that safe, happy, and connected, then learning, healing, and thriving is most possible. And I have found doing some kind of the brain dance to honor myself, do this kind of um, work with the body. And um, the, there's eight patterns. And so I just, I wanna do a, a few of them with you. It's the best to do them all eight together. Um, but I, with time and space, um, if you could just try them out with me, they're about being mindful in the body. It starts with breath. So I want you to just, I used to do this with my masters and teaching students. I taught them the box breath that's become very well known now, but um, let's do the box breath together. And we'll use this box and I'll help you out. And as I learned from Anne Green Gilbert this last summer, um, it is really helpful to start with an out breath to ground your body. So if you could join me, this is just an example of something that I try out in spaces um, to bring us all together and rest in our body and rest our minds in our body. 
All right, so I'm gonna push down on this side and that's the breathing out and then I'm gonna hold and then I will raise my hand, that's the in and then I'll hold and then I will go out. All right, so let's try it together. So we're gonna breathe out. Hold. And breathe in. Hold. And breathe out. And I usually say, and help us remember that everything moves and is created with breath. So bringing that into a learning space is really important. Having a mindful breath, that was just once. Usually I try to do that three times. And there's so many ways to do breath practice. And then um, another pattern of the brain dance is touch. So I just usually start with just, if you could just put one hand on your chest, and just notice what's going on for you as you're listening to me and thinking about school, thinking about putting this in school. Some of you already do with it, something like this. And then tactile touch, you know, you can tap all the way down. You can do all sorts of different touch, but I usually start here and you can brush, you can squeeze. Yeah, and you can go all the way down to your toes. And students can do this sitting in their chairs. They can do this standing up. You can do it any way that works for your context. And this one um, is core distal. So we also have a core and we have edges. So just reach out, just do a big reach and bring it in. Yeah, that's core distal. And we'll do the fourth one, head tail. We have this amazing spine. So if you Go to the top of your head and go to the bottom of your spine. And don't forget how critical and important that is. And give yourself a hug. Twist behind you. And this is something I learned from Res Momenicum too. For, all, for folks dealing with um, PTSD, looking behind you and naming and noting that you are safe helps calm your brain. So if we can do that, if we can just twist and then twist the other way. Those are four of the brain dance patterns. And usually they're good to do all eight all together. But with the time and what we're doing here, I just wanted to show you the first four. And your mind can get creative about how the brain dance can be used in your spaces. I think about that. And as we're doing these exercises, I'm like noticing like just like the physical manifestations I have, even as being a vulnerable person, I'm sitting in front of this webinar, right? Like having this um, right now one-sided conversation and we're having this presentation. I also think about like, how does this play such a crucial role in these exercises or routines that we honor in classrooms? How can that play a crucial role in behavior? has been a big deal over the past couple of years. And how do you build those strong relationships with your students? Perhaps is it through these exercises? How do we make sure that our students feel like they're coming into a space where they're feeling like they can de-escalate, like they can feel like I, I can feel myself have these physical manifestations as a student, whether I'm going through personal things at home and I'm coming back into this classroom space. Perhaps this is another great grounding technique and setting the tone for what the classroom is going to look like for them. Yeah, it, it can be the, um, I really, this is my passion, but I really think starting with the body, like noting the energy that's walking in the door, um, knowing that doing my own kind of grounding in front of the students is modeling like, okay, folks, I'm, I'm feeling pretty, like I just had a conversation. I just need to kind of take some breaths. Um, that passing time, you know, just that kind of modeling of being that um, transparent um, 
you know, um, appropriate transparency with students about my emotional responses to the, our time together. So that kind of vulnerability, I feel, has worked well to make those relations that can then move us ahead and finding working ground together and um, tending to some of the behavior that's happening in front of me. Um, and I, yeah, just in my experience, I've seen also teacher candidates just choose to be more transparent and, and be clear about what they're doing and their beliefs and why they're doing it and being transparent about who they are in the room and, um, and writing and sketching and computing and dissecting and analyzing and questioning in front and with students, doing that vulnerable work of learning in the moment. Um, when I started writing in front of students, that really, I feel like changed the tone of my teaching. Students were seeing me take the risk of sharing and working through problems that I'm asking them to do right in front of them. And crafting time each week, like really crafting time for students to talk to one another. You, we cannot create a safe space if we really don't know each other. Like it will you will continue to enter the room wondering what is going to happen. So really putting that emphasis on crafting time each lesson, each week. Um, but I mean, every day, every lesson, every class period, I would try to say the student's name at least once. Every student's every name. They would hear their name said by another student. Everyone's talking at least once every class which takes a lot of thinking through how to do that for your, um, your lesson plan. But it's really worth it. I've seen, I've seen great Im impacts and name said at least once per class and talking at least once per class. That's amazing that you bring that up because I also think how important and crucial it is to take the time to even learn how to pronounce your students' names correctly and just setting that tone from the beginning of this of the school year, right? And so we're, we're talking a lot about the beginning of the school year. And I'm wondering how do you navigate your process towards transitions? As we're closing the school year, what are some moves that you use or rituals that you implement in your classroom as we're, as a student is transitioning and making their way out, out of your classroom and perhaps even into another classroom or you know, you you brought up earlier the the idea of space and moving and permeability. How do you handle some of those transitions in your classroom as we're starting to close out the year? Mm -hmm. A couple of things that I've done that I've seen have some positive impact. Um, projects of gratitude that so at the end of the year, having that reflection back about who has supported you, who has created a sense of belonging. Um, I would often have the students write letters of gratitude to anyone in the school building. Um, throughout the year, I usually, I mean, the students know, would know that there's the way that our weeks work, there's usually time for check-ins and celebrations every week um, in community building. So that's something that I've built in through the year. And then at the end of the year, we do you know, uh, more of that. And um, uh, for example, that common ground game that I talked about, people have probably played it, but it, I saw over the year people being more and more vulnerable with their stories. And so by the end of the year, we're talking about people who feel scared to go on to the next step, people. And so then we rally around one another and have that kind of open sharing by the end of the year. Um, yeah, so I'd say some projects, some work, some literature, some things that have students look back and look at the goals that they've met, you know, that goal setting, all that, look at that work that they've done and me naming things about them that are, um, I, I affirm them and having others affirm them in the classroom and then um, having those activities that we get to look at each other and have joy together. And then also some projects, activities, thinking literature, things that um, have them look forward and set those goals, set those, have that vision, that envisioning for themselves. So that's kind of, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much, Sally, for everything that you've shared and even modeling what it would look like to be in your classroom. I am like feeling and wishing that I could have been a student in your classroom. So we really appreciate you sharing all these wonderful tips and rituals that you implement in your classroom and how they're received by your students. So thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here with us. Thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you to all. Thanks for being here with me. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull some slides here in a second. We're gonna get ready to close out. So we hope that today's webinar doesn't stop here, but that it is permeable to Sally's point earlier about what this looks like in your schooling experience, especially in your classrooms. We love when these ideas go out to leadership and our leadership teams, PLCs, and when they get discussed with students. So we're also gonna be sharing some amazing resources. I'd like to take some time to share with you all funding opportunities. Ronnie has been really great and phenomenal in the chat in making sure that you have a resource guide and links to all these amazing things that we've talked about today, including uh, access to books that were mentioned by Sally earlier and by Nick as well. So you'll find an array of different resources and funding opportunities as well as some social emotional learning modules and please, please take advantage of that resource guide. And you will also receive a copy of the PowerPoint slides from today. Here are just some of the books and websites we touched on earlier and some cool tools and videos. We, I mentioned we're unlocking federal and state funds document that can help you braid funding this year to meet your needs. We have those SEL academic integration models that should be posted here soon if you'd like to go deeper on these ideas. We also have a couple of newsletters that you might be interested in, including the social emotional learning newsletter and, of course, our engaged newsletter. I mentioned earlier, Sally did highlight an array of different reading lists that you can add to your library and to your toolkit. So there are also so many helpful websites that you might be interested in, including Danielson's framework is a helpful self-check. And of course, the brain dance and the eight patterns are also linked um, in the resource guide. Of course, American Institute of Research has resources and you can always connect with us and the OSPI staff with this link. If you don't know the answer to things, we're so happy to direct you to whoever you need. Our next month's webinar is gonna be on family engagement best practices. And we will be joined by Therese Moore, who is an author and family and community engagement consultant for the Family and Engagement Network. And these links, of course, will be available in the chat if you wanna register now. So please share this link with your friends and colleagues who may be interested. We're always interested in continuous improvement and we can take a quick poll to see how we did today and our feedback survey will launch after the webinar closes too. So if you'd like to provide more qualitative feedback, you're welcome to do so. So we've got our poll launched. Please feel free to add to the evaluation. Looks like there's a Q&A. Oh. Do we need to fill out an attendance form? Uh, I believe Kefi has answered that. And we will speak about it in just a moment, especially on registration for clock hours and such. But thank you for letting us know what you think. And if something comes up to you later, you're always having the option to sh share your thoughts um, and, and opinions with us about how we did today. 
Do you need clock hours? We'd love to see our listeners get clock hours for joining us today. If you joined live, you've already registered um, for the year through Zoom. You'll also need to register for clock hours monthly and PD Enroller. PD Enroller will send an evaluation to your email and will verify your attendance and release your hours. If you're watching this video later on YouTube, the process does change. You register each month for clock hours and PD Enroller and complete the evaluation. You'll also do our graduation equity webinar feedback survey, the one we just spoke to earlier to signal us what you watched. And we'll verify your attendance every two weeks and release your hours that way. So if you have questions about this, please feel free to email Ronnie Larson, who does our clock hour support. Thank you all so much for being here and we look forward to seeing you next month for September's webinar. Bye-bye.